Hey, this is Warren Redlick. I wanted to talk about cooties or about a micro model of epidemiology and how diseases spread. I like to think of it in terms of cooties because that's what kids talk about. and Maybe it makes sense to kids. One of the first things you need to think about when someone gets cooties is how long does the person continue to have cooties and how long can that person spread the cooties to other people? In other words, how long does someone stay infectious? In the context of COVID-19, we've seen numbers in the ballpark of 14 days. It could be longer. This is important because if someone stays infectious longer, it means they need to be quarantined longer. It means they are a risk to others longer if they have the virus. If they're infectious for a short time, then they're less likely to spread the disease. If they're infectious for a long time, they're more likely to spread the disease. There's also levels of infectiousness. There are some reports that people who are asymptomatic are less likely to spread the infection, and people who are more symptomatic are more likely to spread the infection. That's not really clear yet, and it could matter. But right now, we're just talking about how long does someone stay infectious and how that matters. A really big thing that's central to what I want to talk about today is the probability that an infected person, let's say Jimmy on the left here, is going to infect an uninfected person, let's say Emily on the right. If Jimmy has a lot of close contact with Emily, maybe their brother and sister, maybe their close friends, if they have a lot of close contact, then it's more likely that he will transmit the virus to her because they're together for a long period. But the first question that you want to start with in a micro model is, how likely is he to pass the infection to her in a single encounter? Jimmy's walking down the hallway. He passes by Emily in the hallway. Hi, Emily. Emily says, hi. How likely is that one brief encounter to transmit the infection? And the answer is very, very low. The question is, what happens is that's a, that's a very, very low probability event. Very low. Much lower than 1% chance. What happens, though, is when people have close contacts with each other, when they see each other repeatedly, when, they're, when they have closer contact to each other, they're more likely to transmit the virus. But this probability, this one shot, they walk by in the hallway, they high-five each other, they, they have some kind of brief encounter, is actually a very low probability of transmission of the virus in that situation. What really causes viruses to transmit with higher likelihood is when you have repeated contacts and when you have close contacts. I got my uh, introduction to modeling epidemiology in college. I went to college in the 1980s when the AIDS epidemic was happening, and we actually modeled transmission of HIV in a college course I was in, and the model that I'm putting forward here is somewhat similar to the model we worked on there. When the HIV virus was spreading, there were certain types of people who were engaging in certain kinds of behavior that ended up being very likely to transmit the virus, or I should say more likely than other types of behavior. Certain uh, particularly homosexual male behaviors were likely to have blood-to-blood -blood contact, and that increased the likelihood of transmitting the disease. Also, people using intravenous needles, especially if they're sharing needles. And what's most likely to cause the disease to transmit is repeated contacts, repeated encounters, and, and, bad, and bad encounters, encounters that are more likely to spread. So the problem is that in the HIV epidemic, there were certain populations that were engaging in high-risk behaviors repeatedly many times a day over you know, days, months, weeks, and that meant that the virus spread very rapidly in certain populations. So certain things reduce the probability of transmission. One, which a lot of us have been following, is distance. We call it social distancing with COVID-19, but if Jimmy stays six feet away from Emily, he's less likely to transmit the virus to her. One theory of transmission, and more than one could be true, one theory of transmission is that when Jimmy exhales, coughs, or sneezes, the virus could jump in the uh, air from through his breath or through his sneeze over to Emily that way. Another theory is that he coughs on his hand, he touches something, or he touches her, she touches her nose, and it gets spread that way. Or he touches something, she touches it, and she gets it that way. We're not really sure, but the general theory is that if you stay further apart, you're less likely to transmit the virus. And this makes a lot of sense in pretty much any model. Another thing that really increases the chance of an infected person transmitting it to others, here Emily is in the group of six of her friends, is you have encounters with more than one person. So if you have a lot of encounters with a lot of people and you're close together in a group, then that probability of transmitting to one person might be small, but if you have six people around you, you've just multiplied that probability by six. Then, of course, the more time you spend together, the closer you are to each other. Again, that increases the chance that an infected person is going to transmit the virus to other people. So not having uh, groups packed closely together is a way of reducing transmission of the virus. If you reduce the number of people who get together, you go from instead of having seven people together, you go from to having four. Now, instead of it multiplying the probability by six, you've only multiplied the probability by three. 
If you stay a little further apart, you're reducing the probability of transmission again. If you really get down to it's just you and one other person, you stay six or more feet apart, you're dramatically reducing the chance of transmission from the infected person to an uninfected person or uninfected people. Other steps people have been talking about are wearing masks and gloves. One principal way people talk about it is that if an infected person is wearing a mask, that will prevent the infected person from sneezing or coughing or reduce the distance that a sneeze or cough or breath will travel and that will protect uninfected people around the infected person. Wearing gloves, at least in some theory, wearing gloves helps prevent that person from spreading the infection by their hands. Of course, if they wear the gloves for a long period of time, it's not clear how much it helps, but it may help a little at least. Not only that, but a mask and gloves can protect an uninfected person from infected people. Some people think this isn't as reliable. Not really sure. Uh, it certainly doesn't hurt to wear a mask and gloves as far as I can see. And all these steps can help reduce the transmission from infected person to an uninfected person or from, in, from infected people to uninfected people. And that reduces the spread. This brings us close to a conclusion. We've been doing all of these things for quite a long time. It's been a while now that a lot of us, at least a month, that a lot of us have been staying away from other people, minimizing our contact with other people, not going to get getting in together in groups. We've been, you know, we walk in our neighborhood and some people will walk in the street to avoid getting clo too close to other people, which really seems to misunderstand that initial point about a brief encounter not really having a high probability of transmitting the virus. But a lot of people are doing a lot of things to minimize their encounters with other people. And this has been going on for more than a month. If the infectious period is less than a month, and a lot of people think it's 14 days, then that should dramatically reduce the spread of the virus. When people talk about the virus is growing or spreading exponentially, it makes me scratch my head because I could understand if we were doing nothing that the virus would spread exponentially. But we have been doing a lot for at least 30 days and people are still talking about the virus spreading exponentially, which doesn't really make sense. And some people, like the mayor of Los Angeles, uh, he's talking about shutting down everything through June and then shutting down everything again in the fall through the winter and maybe another shutdown after that. That seems odd because it's not clear why we would need to shut down everything for so long. And it's disturbing because in the end, these shutdowns in my opinion, and in the opinion of quite a few other people now, these shutdowns are going to kill a lot more people. When you have these shutdowns, you are shutting down the economy, you are dramatically affecting people's livelihood, you are making, you are socially isolating people. These things are going to spike the suicide rate, the stress levels are going to affect people with heart disease and other conditions. There's a lot of potential problems here with these shutdowns. It really makes me wonder what's the point of all these shutdowns for so long if we've done so much for 30 days that it should have dramatically reduced the spread of the virus. What are we doing? If we can't go, and if, we, if it doesn't help, then why are we doing it? Uh, there's a lot of questions here. That leads us to the final point, which is we have people who are making these decisions, and it's not really clear why we're trusting people like this to make these decisions. None of them have distinguished themselves as particularly good decision makers. Certainly, there's a lot of people who think some people are better than others. Personally, I think they're all... Uh, not very good at what they do, not very good at making decisions, and certainly not better than we are at making decisions for ourselves. We are creating a very, very difficult situation for our economy that will have long-lasting consequences, both the U.S. economy and the global economy. These consequences are very severe in many different ways. I'm personally much more concerned about this damage they're doing to the economy than I am about the virus, even though I do think the virus merits some concern. What do you think? Please let me know in the comments. Thanks very much for listening and watching.